Hezky. Apologies in advance. This one looks as the next step. Okay. Great. All right. Um, a lot has been written in terms of modern about the early hours of the first millennium. Uh, to quote three books that are very accessible when you're looking for them in the Google store. This is from 2022, not a, spe a specialist of Arabic, someone who's lived in Yemen, who's written extensively about the Arabs in the Middle Ages, and who was a very long time traveler to back across the edge, and not specifically an archaeologist or a historian in early Arabia, but a, uh, someone who's actually summarizing the data, and his first chapters are on what I'm going to talk about. Another man, Reso, who's a Swedish scholar, Martin Kurslov. Who actually wanted to know what the meaning of Arab was in antiquity, what the meaning of Arab was in classical sources, Mesopotamian sources, Greek sources, and later on, explaining in this introduction that our modern conception, like linked to states, linked to language, linked to culture, uh, our ideological conceptions of the 20th century tend to be projected back into the past, and they're not very helpful in defining what. Uh, Arab in the bottom. Oh, what does that mean? Thank you. What does that mean? That's right. Oh, can you allow people in? That's what we need to do. That's what we need to do. That's what we so, and the third book by a historian from an officer, Robert Boylan. Uh, don't pay attention to the cover because the cover is about South Arabia. And South Arabia, Arabia Felix, is a different world altogether. The Arabs actually. Um, migrate slowly much much later as in the third second century bc when they're beginning to have a kingdom of the united kingdom called Niar. before that you have sabians had around and briefly mentioned them but it's not specifically within the subject but the book is also about uh the early pre-islamic arabian, arabian kingdoms uh, the first mentions of the arabs right up to uh the advent of islam and the fall of a kingdom called Kinda, which controls southwest and central Arabia. Can um, you just like stay on this? Okay, so as I said, a lot of this is about how Mesopotamian emperors, empires, and specifically the Assyrians, see what's going on in the margins of the South Levant, the margins of Mesopotamian Syria, and in uh, desert Arabia. So with a map of the Assyrian empires and its different phases of expansion, as you know, centered on North Mesopotamia, beginning in the second millennium um, in the time called Ashur, and then all these towns did a big or short you know, later foundations, but expanding in the early ninth century, uh, the reigns of uh, Ashur Nazi called the second and Shalkins of the third, reaching the Euphrates, reaching the northern Syro Hittite and uh, uh, Luvian and Aramean kingdoms and states. And then further later on, in a second phase of late Syrian expansion, as from the middle of the eighth century, expanding all the way even into Egypt before 671, and then slowly contracting, but lasting until 610 BC. So, most of what we're going to know about the early Arabs in this part, so the margins of Syria, the northern Levant, the northern Hejaz is going to be seen through Mesopotamian eyes, and this is very, very important. Um, and specifically, sorry if it's not very clear, but one thing that is going to project the Arabs onto the Middle East, the, the uh, Mesopotamian and Levantine Sea is going to be 
a road that comes up all the way through what is now Jordan, across the Andes Kingdoms, reaching Damascus. The royal road, which is very important because this is where, this is like the terminal road of, uh, in antiquity, um, for trade, for trade as known in frankincense, but other commodities as well. Um, right. But of course, things are happening at the end of the second millennium, at the beginning of the first millennium. Things are happening that make the Arabs get into contact with Mesopotamian and uh, Syrian Levantine city states. But of course, the domestication of the camel. Now, the team theories uh, it's very debatable where camels were first domesticated. There's a site in Yemen called Hajar bin Humay. 10th century BC, 11th century BC, where there are camel bones. There's even been something done in the Emirates that would push it back to the third millennium BC, but that's very doubtful. They might involve camels. And of course, there is evidence accumulating as from the end of the second millennium in various parts of the Middle East and in Arabia of actually the camel being used as a piece of burden to carry goods across the deserts. Uh, before camel nomadism, you cannot speak of true nomads. In the third, second, and second millennium, you of course have semi nomads like the Amorites, like um, uh, the Sutians uh, in uh, Syria and northern Mesopotamia, that are constantly linked to urban supplements. They are in a sort of symbiosis. This is what we call a demorphic social structure, where actually um, the nomads are essential to uh, urban society and urban, um, and, uh, urban society needs in a certain way the nomads. Before the domestication of the camel, I'll mention, for example, the Amorites. The Amorites slowly become urbanized. They're essentially semi-nomads with sheep and monkeys in the steppe, but very near the settlements. And they rise, they become soldiers, they become craftsmen. And towards the early second millennium BC Mesopotamia and Syria, they actually become the heads of dynasties, and almost all of them. If I were to mention Hammurabi and Babylon, he's from a dynasty of nomads, um, of Amorite nomads, and he is, I think, the seventh or eighth generation. Of course, they integrate the urban structure and they become soldiers, bodyguards, and they take power. Same for the first Assyrian kingdom around 1850 BC, the kingdom of Sapsi he traces his ancestry to people living in tents. But at that age, in the early second millennium, these are not true nomads. Now everything changes with the domestication of the camel. What is very odd, so the earliest piece of evidence is this. From Wadi Nassab, I think it's like in Egypt, where you actually have sort of, it's what you call proto-Sinaitic writing from the 15th, 14th century BC. This is actually derived from Egyptian hieroglyphs, but it is the first alphabet in the Levant. It spreads. This is what is going to later on give rise to the Canaanite and Phoenician alphabet. This, this kind of alphabet was first found by an Egyptologist called the Petri in the 20th in Sinai, hence the name proto Sinaitic. And next to this inscription from Wadi Nasab, you have someone holding. Uh, by the color, a camel. So perhaps first attempts of domestication were around 1400 BC, and not in Arabia, but in uh, but in Sinai between Asia and Egypt. Then later on, this is totally maybe anecdotal. This is from 840 830 BC. What you have here are Bactrian camels, which is very very odd. This is a monument called the Black Obelisk. Uh, found, I think, by Layard, excavated in Nimrud, and which is one of the main monuments of King Shalmanes III, uh, who ruled between 869, I think, and 827 BC, and who actually spread the Assyrian Empire right to the Mediterranean. Well, following in the footsteps of his father, Ashurnasipal, whose reliefs are very well known and are now mainly in the British Museum. So, a tribute, but very well, I don't know if this is a mistake, or I don't know if these camels are coming from further east from, I don't know, Iran, Afghanistan, but this is one of the very few representations of a two-month animal, but at the same time, 
we have something appearing already in the 10th century BC, right up in northern Syria. In northern Syria, there's a very um, huge Arabian kingdom called Beat Banyani. Beat means, of course, house, as in royal house, dynasty. And Beat Banyani, capital Guzana, the Guzan of the Bible. You have a palace which is hard to date. It was excavated in the early 20th century by an archaeologist called Max Oppenheim. And among the reliefs of this palace, uh, the Palace of Kapara, some of which you can see in the Berlin Museum, some of which can be reconstructed because there are long distance in 1943. You have a representation of a man on a dromedary and an and, well, Armenian dynasty, so, so let's say 950 900 BC, before the Assyrian conquest, on a camel with a saddle. So a saddle cal camels fully developed. Then later on in the ninth century, you have uh, again, um, objects from a cult center in Greece, having these conveyors and roads. Um, that this is probably either Assyrian or Syrian, if you look at the hairstyle of the uh, individual on the drum tree. And here we are also talking about domesticated camels. And finally, something from the Assyrian relief that's a bit later on, something in BC, from the siege of Lakish. You have Tibur Bebertes leaving the city when King Snacker. Was besieging it before going up to Jerusalem and locking up the Judean king, Ezekiel, like a bird in the cage, as he says. And you have these deputies hacking their goods on a camel. A very rare representation, but actually not married to the people in the Levant using this animal, probably as a pack animal. So this is what is happening at the time when the first Arabs appear on the historical scene. Now, something even more interesting. Something that was known since the 1960s, thanks to an archaeologist called Peter Carr from the University of College London, who made the first survey in Saudi Arabia, but which is, has been explored by a German Austrian mission directed by Arnold Hausleiter, who is one of the Mesopotamian archaeologists who reconverted, refocused all of his energies and studies in Saudi Arabia. It's a major urban site. This is seen from drone called Korea. Korea, which is not far from the Jordanian border. We're talking about a site which becomes urban around 1200, 1150 BC, maybe two centuries before the first mention of the Arabs by Mesopotamian sources. So something is going on. Some, there's a movement towards some kind of oasis urbanism that is happening in the des desert parts of Arabia. This is one of the northernmost settlements. And this settlement, I mean, this settlement exists already in the early Bronze Age. Uh, Marta Luciani, who's a wife of Arnold, Arnold Hausleiter, actually discovered evidence for uh, EB4, early Bronze Age 4, pottery from 2200 BC in some of the graves. So these people are already in full connectivity, in full contact with the Levant and probably Mesopotamia, but it's, it becomes really something much bigger around after, after the fall of the empires of the uh, late Bronze Age, um, after the uh, Full of the um, Hittite and Egyptian empires in the Levant and Syria. So, something this is, I'm giving you the bigger picture, the sort of citizen leader where the first Arab tribes, the first Arabs are going to sort of appear on the historical scene. Something is happening with a, a movement towards urbanism in certain parts of the Hejaz. And also, this uh, concomitant coeval with this. Urbanism in Korea and other sites like Taima, which is the first, um, well, uh, which is the first big project in Saudi Arabia by the foreign team in 2005. Um, you have the spread of what we call Midianite poetry. Now, this is actually quite, um, quite interesting. This is a pottery that appears all over Sinai. It's called Midianite because of obviously the Israeli archaeologists who discovered it for the first time, associated it to Madian in the Old Testament, the Exodus, which is associated to Sinai and Northwest Arabia, uh, the place where Moses went into exile. Uh, and the Midianites are a biblical people who are like said to live there. Okay, this is just a denomination. This is now called Koraya Taima Ware. Koraya Ware, because first found Koraya, and now Taima, which is uh, something quite Incredible because it's a type of pottery spread over an immense territory. An immense territory is a pottery that uh, like appears around 1150, dies out around probably 
900 BC, uh, typically painted as far north as the site, the temple site near where the Amon airport was extended in the 70s, uh, discovery by Australian archaeologists called Basil Hennessy, and right down to Taima, which is 800 kilometers from the um, uh, from the Caribbean border of Milton to Saudi Arabia. At the same time, so we're talking about uh, an Arabia that's now very connected with the Levant and with the um, with Mesopotamia, but also, and this is extremely recent, this is from 2013 from Taima with Egypt. The Egyptians actually, it was never known that the Egyptians did launch expeditions into Arabia. This is, so here you have, now it's not a really word of Egypt. This is the, one of the names of Ramses III, who also left his name on copper mines in on the border between Sinai and uh, in Arabia at uh, Tina. And this is the first time there is evidence for Egyptian movement or Egyptian exchange or some kind of expedition with peoples on the other side of the race. So this is just to give you an idea of the context in which we will find the first mention of Arabs, or to quote them by their name in the Mesopotamian sources, Aribu or Aribi. So this is this is obviously not from the Iron Age, but this is one of the sites where expeditions like the one I joined in 2012 2013 were expecting to find evidence of the Iron Age contemporary with these first mentions of Arabs in the Mesopotamian sources. It, it, it was found in some of the huge soundings. This is a site in northwest of Saudi Arabia, which incidentally has one of the earliest mosques in Islam, apparently, from the late 7th century, the early 8th century uh, AD, or well, first century of Hijra. This is the site of Umad al Jandal, which is known to be the ancient city or the ancient oasis of Adumatu. And Adumatu is known to be, in sources of the 7th century, one of the main strongholds of a big. Arab tribe that is going to be very, very important in the mid first millennium, the tribe of Kedar, which is mentioned also in biblical texts in the Bible. So, as I explained, what makes Arabs come migrate into the fringes of the Levant and Mesopotamia, what makes what made them interested in this part of the world is the road. Forget about the name Petra, this is totally anachronistic. But it's the development of the trans Arabian trade with Arabia Felix with the Yemen that goes through a road that we call the Royal Road. Going through these are all kingdoms of the Iron Age mentioned in the Bible Edom on both sides of the Arabah Valley with the Red Sea, Moab, um, which is a kingdom that fights a lot against Israel in the 9th century, but becomes actually a state in the 9th century. Edom is a little bit later, and Ammon, which is centered around. Well, modern Amman, it's, it's the royal road to Damascus, an alternative road going through a long body called Wadi Sirhan into more in, 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 inland into the um, inland reaches of the desert of Arabia, with, of course, the mention of Kedar. Who level the general site I mentioned here is at the extremity of Wadi Sirhan uh, near modern, well, it's in the Jof region of Saudi Arabia. So, just happening at the same time, for the cursory notes, the development of the trans Arabian trade in which the Arabs seem to be involved, in which the Arabs seem to uh, um, be part of, uh, is linked, of course, to the rise of states in the 9th and 8th century BC in the Yemen. Now, uh, one of the earliest kings uh, to write an inscription, alphabetic inscriptions are always linked to the Iron Age to the development of the states. So one of the earliest operating inscriptions is from this site over here in Yamarad, with the temple of the national god of Saba Amaka. This is the inscription for the king of Kerbil Watar. There are many Kerbils, he founds a dynasty, and in fact, some of his descendants will be mentioned in the Syrian sources, Kerbil of the Now, Saba is not directly linked or to the, at the origin of the trans Arabian trade. It's rather Hadramat, with his capital Shadwa, that Saba is a participant in the sense of caravans after Saba, but the main emphasis of Saba is territorial and agricultural. As you know, with this big battle Mari, Mari, I'm sorry, mentioned in the Quran, it's going to last for a thousand years. And this king, Kerbil Wachar, who dated around 800 BC, is going to be one of the first to 
try to uh, expand agricultural land by making this dam, allowing the fertilization and the agricultural surface, which allows the state to survive. And obviously, finally, the first levels of this temple, which is called the uh, Alam Temple in Nagara, and this one called Nagara Vilkis, that's a modern name, Vilkis being from Shiva, supposedly, um, which is uh, the Baran Temple, all originating in the 8th century, but going on until obviously being used for 800 years. So, this is just to give you an idea of the context of why the Arabs are there, why they become uh, either like companions of trade or a threat to it, and why the Mesopotamians are interested in either co-opting them or fighting them. As I said, the Assyrian perspective on the, uh, sorry, the first mentions of the Arabs or the move to or remove to being a, determ um, a determinative for like people, it just means uh, people, men, Sumerians, which right in front of uh, an ethnic group. Well, the first mentions are from the Assyrians, and the Assyrians are not going to be too pleased with the arrival of the Arabs on the scene, and it is a cool to be an enemy of Assyria. This is what happens when, you know, you submit to Assyria and you agree to follow their, uh, their orders, their instructions. Here you have a king, an Austrian king, probably of a state called Katiramuki, which is in the area of Anjok, kneeling before Taiwan the Leezer. The king of mid, uh, mid to late uh, 8th century BC. Here, this is what happens when a certain kingdom is conquered. You have rows and rows and rows of deputies leading to the other side of the empire. This is obviously from the lakeish release uh, from 701 BC. And here you have the same phenomenon with deputies from Elam much later on. Uh, Elam being one of the states devastated by the Assyrians, one of the uh, last greatest kings of Assyria, Ashurbanipal. Um, this is when uncool stuff happens and when people are punished from these animals. This is also from Blackish Reliefs, people being played alive, basically, people being jailed, and obviously the um, uh, casualties being um, used as trophies by the Assyrians. So this is controlled terror, and we will see this also. In campaigns of Ashurbanipal against the Arabs, settling into the Fertile Crescent, settling, going into the Syrian desert, and not being able to be co opted or used by the Assyrians, the, uh, the, the Assyrian kings. So, the world vision of the Assyrians is actually important to, um, um, to understand their vision of the Arabs, their understanding of the Arabs. Uh, I'm giving you a brief example which has nothing to do with the Arabs, but which shows you that the further the, the Assyrian view of the world is very sort of uh, Mesopotamia centric, uh, and anything in the further reaches is peopled by mythical creatures, such as this one, the mermaid you see here, by turtles and snakes, sea snakes, and this, or by Lamasu, who are like. Guards, um, human headed bulls with wings in this case. And this is a representation of the Phoenician coral coast in the palace of Corsabad, built by Sardin. You have these reliefs in the Louvre. They're one of the few surviving ones because the rest sank underwater in the Tigris River. I mean, here you have a city which is probably Tyre. And of course, you have all these, um, all these um, um, sailors or uh, uh, people who are uh, represented that this is how they represent people of the Phoenician coast with typical boats with coarse uh, prows uh, carrying wood because obviously what the Assyrians are interested in when it comes to Lebanon is cedar wood and lumber that they ship back to the Western coast and then down the Euphrates to Mesopotamia. So, uh, a very sort of core and periphery uh, case of empire. I mean, uh, this sort of um, mental model, uh, these mental maps of these series would be very much studied by a uh, Mesopotamian historian, literally called Mario Lavarani. Um, so, and while they represent the world, they are very much into providing details of costume, of ethnicity, that are in fact extremely accurate. I mean, these monuments are there, they're in the throne rooms of palaces, they're there to be seen by visitors, by ambassadors. By the Assyrian nobility. Uh, I mean, most people cannot read the uniform writing and captions. So 
they have to immediately associate costume and representation with specific scenes and specific people that they know the costume are. To give you an example, this is how Arameans in northern Syria are shown with these pointy caps, with these long fringe robes. This is one of the first representations of them in the release of Ashur Nazifal from the early 9th century from Nimrud. This is how Judahites from Judah are shown with these kinds of turbans uh, with a flat on the side. And you even have soldiers that are integrated into the Assyrian army that have them, which make us think of mercenaries from Judah. We certainly have evidence in the Assyrian texts of uh, Judahites and uh, Israelites from the uh, fallen kingdom of Samaria, from Israel, that are integrated into the Assyrian ar uh, army. And this is how, for example, a, an Israelite is shown. This is actually a person mentioned in the Bible. It's King Jehu. Uh, and he is described as being from Bethel Bria. Bethel Bria means the house of Omri. Omri is one of the kings of the Old Testament. So here is the first extra biblical evidence for kings of the Iron Age from around 840 BC. He's kneeling on the black bubbles in front of King Shalmaneser and his courtiers and officials with the winged disc of Ashur, like William Supreme over him. So he's basically, yeah, kissing the feet of the Assyrian, uh, the Assyrian uh, king. So this representation of uh, foreigners, of conquered peoples, is so accurate that if you compare it, for example, with how these foreigners represented themselves very quickly, for example, this is an Aramean king, Called Kilamua, uh, ruling a city state called uh, Samal, uh, modern day Sinjali, a site that's currently being excavated by the University of Chicago. And he is wearing a three robes. This is something I won't get into, but he's wearing a, an Aramean pointed hat and the fleece hat of his attendant uh, or of his son or of his servant uh, is very much um, is, is also described on certain reliefs and appears on certain techniques uh, as well. So I'm just wanting to emphasize that the representation of the Assyrians of the various ethnicities of their chronic peoples is really meant to show detail and really meant it's not just a sort of caricature, it really went into um, portraying the people that they conquered. Uh, for example, here you have a um, this is from Zinjali as well. This is a recent discovery in 2008 of a man called Kutumua with an Arabic description. Kutumua actually a Libyan name, but he's got this typical police hat of the North Assyrians that you can find with in on the Assyrian release of the Assyrian Chronicles. Now, to come to the first mention of Arabs in history from this monument over here, and this one. These are two stele, what you call in Akkadian a Salash Rutia, an image of my royalty, a very sort of, um, it's a standard uh, representation of the king of Syria doing, um, doing a, with a sort of clenching his fist in prayer. This is a sign called Banatarazu in uh, Akkadian, and in front of the gods who are represented as symbols, and on the stele, you have. Is conquest in the forms of animals. And this year, I conquered such and such a kingdom. I slaughtered so many people. I took over so many um, prisoners. I deported them to Syria. And you have the an event that is described on these two stele from a place in Turkey, the Arabicer called Cork. They were found in the 19th century. And there is the first mention of this person, Jindi. Jindiwu is called a Buharibu or an, an Arab man. So, what happens is a, uh, at the site of a major battle in 853 BC, you have a coalition of Levantine and Norse Syrian kings. So, obviously, in his annals, I destroyed a lot of Bombas, devastated, set fire to Karkar. So, Karkar is the place of the battle. It's a major site on the Orontes, and it's where uh, the Assyrian advance, don't believe the propaganda, was halted for a few years simply because you had Ezra, Ezer, Aramean Ar Ar king of Damascus, who allied with Erbilini, Nubian king of Hamat. Hamat, okay, this is not translated, not the real one, but uh, with Ahab 
kings of Israel in, uh, in Samaria, and with uh, the Achaeans. The Achaeans are people from Cilicia, with the Mostrians. We don't know if they're Egyptians, because Mostri might be Egypt, or it's here, or it might be somewhere else. Arvid might be involved in Arvidites, or our wife, the Phoenician city on the coast. Um, and this is actually Siano, another Phoenician city on the Street Coast. And finally, we get to the thousand camels belonging to the Jebu in Arabian. And then Malang again with the Ammonites, who will be the Ammonites from Jordan. So, trusting in these, except of course, this king, Chamanese of the III, around in 853, announces victory. But it seems that all this coalition of different peoples was actually efficient in stopping the Assyrian advance on the lands beyond the Aransas River and into uh, southern Syria and Palestine. Um, so from there, why, why the first Arabs align with Mayanese kingdoms? Why the first Arabs align with um, um, uh, kingdoms, uh, states, the Jordan Arabian states? Simply because obviously they have a stake in the Arabian trade with these uh, Levantine states, and the Syrian advance is probably going to destroy the um, well, destroy the, the profits that they make in this trade. This it's not by chance. In eight by three, you have these uh, first um, Arabs intervening because they are, as you can see, part and parcel of um, well, of uh, the route of the trade that goes from Yemen all the way to the Levant trade probably frankincense, but then they also act as middlemen for other goods, including um, uh, including purple dye that is taken again across the Syrian desert from the Levant into Mesopotamia. So um, first uh, first contact between the Syrians and the Arabs, conflict, then for a hundred years we hear absolutely 150 years we hear nothing about the Arabs from Mesopotamian sources. Uh, one of the reasons is because Assyria, after Shalmaneser III, enters into a period of civil war and a relative decline. There's a king called Adam Nerari III who actually comes a little bit later. He's one of the last Assyrian kings around 810 95 BC of this first late Assyrian phase of expansion. He is also mentioned in the Book of Kings because he is attacking and extracting tribute from. Damascus, from Damascus, the capital of the southern Armenian kingdom of Iran, but no mention at all of the Arabs, simply probably because the Arab, but the, the Assyrians are uh, trying to hold on to what they already possess uh, between 820 and 750 BC, 745 BC. They're trying to use diplomacy to sort of, you know, keep what they have in northern Syria, and they don't go further down into Palestine, they don't go further down into the desert margins of, uh, of Syria and the Levant, so they will come into contact with the Arabs. Everything changes with the uh, renewed, the Adams, or what we would call the Sardinic dynasty. In 744 BC, there is a coup in Syria by a man called, well, mentioned in the Bible as well, called Pulu, who takes uh, a royal name. The royal name of Shaila Pileser III. Uh, that's the sort of when you hear about the names of Assyrian kings, it's always like the biblicized, the Hebraized version of their names, not the Mesopotamian one. I mean, in this case, Shaila Pileser III is called Tukultia uh, Kilishara, and he is going to basically, instead of extracting tribute, instead of making a, a tributary empire of his possessions. He's actually going to create provinces. He's going to remove dynasties, and he's going to start in 744 with the northern Aramean dynasty close to the level of Arpad. He's going to go down into the Levant all the way from there, and actually uh, be one of the kings who destroys the kingdom of Israel, only leaving a sort of core territory around Samaria. And then. Obviously, because of renewed forays into the Levant, renewed forays around along the oil road into Moab and Edom and uh, well, Ammon, the Arabs are going to come back and 
intervene and come into conflict with Assyria. Now, what, what is remarkable in the mid 8th century is that the Arab rulers are mentioned as queens. Um, the, I, I can't really go into detail, but the myth of the Queen of Sheba, Sheba did not have any queens, Sheba is in Yemen, is kind of a mix up and it's probably rem a reminiscence of uh, a tradition of Ur Arabian queens on the margins of the Fertile Crescent in the uh, mid 8th century BC. So, this is we have three queens that are mentioned as fighting against uh, Tylep, Lisa III, and his immediate successors. The first one here, so you have it, the problem with the animals of Tulep Lezer is that they have they're on blocks that were disassembled and they had to be reconstructed. It's a little by an Israeli. Historiologist called Heinz Moore. Um, they had to be uh, reconstructed and they're not in a year by year order. So it's just a list of kingdoms that he uh, conquered or destroyed. As I mentioned, by a few Cilicia, Kuwait, Melit, Malatya in Turkey, uh, Tabal also in Turkey, Tuman, Atiana in the, um, uh, in, uh, also in Cilicia, uh, all these. Then to Karkemish, which is one of the major city. On the Euphrates, um, on the border between Turkey and Syria, and finally we come to the first mention of the Queen of the Arabs, which is Zabibi, uh, which actually is the uh, unlike Jindibu, which actually can be traced to um, a derogatory term, locust grasshopper, which was probably not his name, the king at the Battle of Karkar. Zabibi is probably her real name, obviously, it means, I think, raisin in Arabic. And uh, her successor, Shamsi, Queen of the Arabs, who actually engages into battle and obviously loses against Assyria. So, in the text, to Assyria, I carried them. As for Shamsi, Queen of the Arabs, at Mount Sakuri, I defeated 9,400 people, 1,000 people, 3,000 camels, 80,000 cattle, all kinds of spices thrown into her gods. Arms and staff of her goddess and her property I seized, and she, in order to save her life, uh, to a desert in Arab place, like in Monagher, or like a sheep ass, in certain versions, made off the rest of her possessions and her tents, her people safeguard with the camp I set on fire. Right, so many indications in this uh, in this text of Title of the Third. First of all, the sort of language that they use to describe enemies that seem to be powerless against Assyria, the reference to asses and donkeys. The kingdom of Damascus is also described as he of his donkeys, Shad and Marishu. So, derogatory language typical in Syrian Hebrew inscriptions towards enemies, but an emphasis obviously on camels, an emphasis on cattle nomadism, uh, well, uh, and also an emphasis on. The role probably of this queen in the transferring trade with the mentions of spices and the mention of cultic symbols that travel around that are, are going to be confiscated with, uh, by the Assyrians. When the Assyrians go to war and they conquer city, they remove, remove the set statues of the gods, they take them back to Assyria. There are actually representations of this on the reliefs of Tupac Blizzard III, so that the city is not protected. By its divinities. In this case, we are dealing with nomads, so they're portable items that symbolize the gods, and they're going to be taken back to, the, to, to Syria and actually are going to be returned a few generations later by an Assyrian king in the early 7th century called Isar Adam, which will have well, who will actually try to co opt the Arabs in, on the margins of the Fertile Crescent and the northern Nishas. Uh, so, here again, Conflict, but everything changes. So you have a representation of probably Sam C right here on one of the releases of the Lazar of her mm -hmm. camels and uh, of the tribute or that, that is extracted from her in rams and sheep and prisoners, our prisoners, always, and this is going to be typical of the way they're shown with their hairdo, with their short tails. That are being ushered in by an Assyrian charishi or eunuch into the Assyrian court. 
Now, something I found out, which is quite interesting, I was speaking about this in Isaac was looking at the excavations of the Nasir Palace at the site here, Tul Arsip, on Tul Ahmar, a site where I worked in the 2000s, 2010, for the Belgian Australian expedition. Now, this is not from the new excavations of Tul Ahmar. This was one of the first sites in Syria, a Syrian site to be excavated with a huge palace. Uh, you always, the Syrian palace is a very standard. You always have a part which is the bottom, the official, um, the official uh, area where officials and foreigners and dignitaries were received at the time, which are the inner apartments. And in the Bitano, not in the official part, this is how it must have been in those days in the throne room between the Babani and the Bitano, between the two areas of the palace. This is also reconstructed. It was a palace covered not in reliefs, but by paintings. So it makes everything beautiful today because there are no inscriptions that are associated with this king. But you have to look at style, you have to look at the ways the officials are depicted. Uh, at their paragraphs, I have read my new details to be able to date these paintings. Now, one of the kings who seems to have chosen to paint rather than to carve is this king, Isar Haddon. Um, in 2003, I was invited to London to the Royal Court of Archaeology. I gave a short paper on trying to redate the stylistic reliefs of the palace. And one of the elements that I found striking was this. As if I go back, Costume, but here with more details, is quite similar to, sorry, uh, it's quite similar to what I showed you um, here, the representation of Sansi. And if you look at the hairdo of these people being executed by certain soldiers, these female captives being in prison under the dress, I would like to conclude that these might be also representations of Arabs. And stylistically, it would probably be to this game, these are Haddon. So we're talking about something happening around 680, 670 BC. So again, conflict, again, expansion. But what is interesting about this game as well is that his policy is going to change. He's also going to try to co opt certain tribes. And he's going to have a relationship with one of the rulers or the queens in the site that I showed, uh, I showed you pictures of, the site of Adumatu, Adumatu General. Adumatu, in the reign of Isar Adam, is ruled by someone of the Mesopotamians of the Assyrians called the Akkalatu. Now, Akkalu is one of the mythical wise men around the god of wisdom and water, Ea'enki. Akkalatu this probably means wise woman, wise woman in the sense of probably soothsayer, priestess. And so there's going to be a sort of, uh, they're going to engage in not only conflictual relations, but they're going to try to basically um, uh, well, try to integrate them into the sort of merchant and tributary uh, circuits of the empire. This, uh, we don't know the name of Akalatu of Atlantu, but what we do know is that this king, Isarhaddon, has also a policy with other nomad tribes by making, using them as a kind of police force in the empire. If I, if, uh, if you will, a sort of better police like in Jordan before, uh, before modern times. For example, Isarhaddon is going to besiege the site of Sidon. Uh, he's going to destroy Sidon. And he's going to, which is rebelling in 671 BC, Sidon in Lebanon, in Phoenicia. He's going to create a new town in front of it called Dar and Sarhaddon. And to control this area, he's going to use tribes of Uteans. Uteans are also nomads in the margins of the southern nomads. So you see the policy of trying to co opt uh, nomadic tribes and integrate them into the empire because obviously they cannot just. Go into the Assyrian town, just go into Arabia, and um, they don't have the means to conquer the oasis one by one and to uh, uh, reduce the populations uh, there into subjection in the same way as they have done in the Lowland, Mesopotamia, or Anatolia. Here again, same here, do uh, 
uh, young boy and an adult with program uh, loss, typical representation of uh, in the in the past to tell that more of people that I would like to identify as a parent. Later on, later on, the picture becomes much more complex. I don't have much time to get into some sort of treaties and networks and alliances because if you look at events year by year in the annals of the king I'm going to mention, Ashur Banipal, sorry, uh, oops, um, I was trying to, if, if you look at the events mentioned by King Ashur Banipal, the picture of who is allied with Syria among the Arab tribes and who is not becomes extremely complicated. This is when we have the mention of Kedar that I spoke of earlier on. But at the same time, when we, uh, I'm talking about this king, Ashurbanipal, uh, the one who built the last palace of Nineveh uh, with reliefs that were found by Osama in the 19th century that are in the British Museum, and the depiction began with the same period, with the same sort of tropes, the association with animal and nomadism of uh, Arabs um, who are at this time, according to the annals, attacking the Syrian desert in the area of Palmyra. Now, one of the reasons why the Arabs started their expansion into the margins for the north is because the Assyrians have created a total paracutum by transforming the uh, Aramean, Alluvian, and Israelite kingdoms into provinces, depopulating these areas through deportations, which obviously. Nature, uh, there's a proverb, I think nature hates emptiness, right? so people will infiltrate where there were urban centers before, where there were kingdoms, and in this case, it will be again Arab tribes. Now, Asr Adamal, who ruled between 661 and 627 BC, who's the last great Assyrian king, he's the one who completely devastates southwest Mediterranean, uh, Susa, Elam. He's, a, he's the one who is obliged to get out of Egypt. Because of Assyria has over time. Now, this man will have a policy of pretty savage extermination of Arab Bedouin tribes infiltrating the lands, uh, as you can see, with uh, Assyrian soldiers and archmen fighting camel riders. This seems to be a panel with two people on the camel. This is actually, this reads like a comic strip. The same people here are represented being shot with arrows and with their camel. Collapsing, uh, probably in the middle of the street step around modern day Palmyra. Uh, a few details here. And actually, I don't have a slide here to show the depictions of tents, uh, of actually pretty savage scenes. There is a basically on these reliefs, there is a woman who's being disemboweled, or probably a repeat just as we cut off. Um, so a display of, uh, of violence, typical of the Assyrians, uh, control violence, but at the same time, a very complex picture of immersion, year by year, of um, kings of Kedar in northwest Arabia revolting, being replaced, but then allying with Assyria again, um, being replaced and uh, or portraying uh, their treaty with uh, the Assyrian king. Ashurbanipal, or even allying, what, what marks the reign of this last king, Ashurbanipal, is a revolt in Babylonia by his own brother. Isarhaddon does the mistake of dividing the Assyrian Empire into uh, two entities ruled by two brothers. The younger one is Ashurbanipal, who controls most of the Empire except Babylonia, and the other one is Shamashukin, who's going to ally with Elam. Power in southwest Milan that I spoke about, and who is going to rebel? He's a famous star in the palace of the Bible. He's going to die in his palace. So it's going to be like a big civil war within the Eastern Empire. And obviously, the Arabs are going to be very fortunate in a period of gradual contraction and weakness of the Eastern Empire. I mean, the empires have overstepped too much, and they're going to ally with Babylon against Syria, and they're going to be punished for it. And this is hence. You can explain the very violent scenes in these late Assyrian reliefs of the seventh century from Ashurban Paul's house. A last little note, because I was concentrating on, because I feel that depictions 
of uh, foreign peoples are so accurate by these series. I mean, there is a, a real sort of, uh, there's a real sort of, uh, deliberate uh, will of these series to exactly portray the people they see with all their characteristics. I came across this relief in musicians. Now, it is not at all related to the scene, uh, um, to the scene of Abba in Arabia. It is related to a victory of Ashur Adamal over the kingdom of Elam, uh, to a procession, first to Erbil and then to Nineveh, where in the end you see um, a banquet between with Ashur Adamal and his wife, with the head of the Elamite king, uh, Temuman, hanging from the tree, and celebrating this procession. And so, and uh, this banquet, you have musicians who here do, I would tend to equate with uh, representations of the act. So, this is just the detail, but again, it's uh, the importance of the costume, the importance of the depiction of foreign peoples in certain art that uh, uh, is in itself a message uh, to those uh, looking and complaining of the groups. Okay, so this was a very short run through. I mean, there are PhDs that are written on the series of art, uh, especially since that period has opened up the research in the last 20 15 years, and a lot of things are coming out to explain the relationships of, well, desert Arabia with the areas for the north in the UH. So I hope I managed to make the complex picture a little bit uh, accessible. Thank you very much. Was that was that too much information? Shall I give you? Maybe I should give you a microphone. Okay, Dinan is in El Wal. Dinan appears as a kingdom in what would be the Achaemenid period, by inch three, towards the sixth century BC. And what is very interesting is that we don't know at the time if there is a language that you can call Arabic. You have certain dialects that we seen as Arabic dialects or North, I'd say uh, Western Semitic dialects. The languages of Sheba and Adara, South Adara are South Arabian. In fact, South Arabian language is still spoken in Socotra and in uh, Doha. So this, and, and actually Amhara and Giz Ethiopian is a South Arabian language because 2,500 years ago, there was a colonization by people who went into Ethiopia. So it's a little bit of time. But Didan is a kingdom appearing in Elul, it's the first kingdom appearing in Elul Oasis, and they write inscriptions in a language called Edenite, uh, studied notably by the French Sultan of Osama Faris, which is Arabia, through the English Yana. And uh, it's, we know, I mean, some scholars are saying that it's an only called Arabic, some like uh, differ from that. Then you have the kingdom with giant statues. Very inspired by the Hellenistic world in the third century BC in that area called Lydian. Lydian, the Lydian kingdom is based in Taima. They have their own language that perhaps we consider as a form of Arabic. I think Arabic is a language that evolves and becomes established like in the last century before this time. Say the third, fourth, fifth century. <coughs> I'm not talking about script. Now it is known that the Arabic script is uh, derived from Nabataean. Uh, you have actually Arabic inscriptions in the Arabian language and the Arabic language and the classical Arabic language appearing in the fourth century, so much later. I mean, a language evolves, and it is very hard to see to know if one state of the language can, or one dialect can be actually uh, directly associated with the language itself or some, some separate language. So, and then you have a language in the steps of Syria, Jordan. Northwest Arabia, <coughs> very similar to Arabic, but very debated whether it's Arabic, it's Sahaitic. You have 20,000 Sahaitic inscriptions in Jordan, 
It's for the uh, nomads who pass by Wadi Sirhat, who write the names of their tribes, the names of their ancestors, what they're doing, why they're nomads or traders, and it would be a form of Arabic as well. One of the defining features of Arabic, as opposed to other Semitic languages, is the uh, article Al. Uh, for example, in South Arabian languages, you have AN as a definite uh, article. Uh, and not Al, so it's a separate group, though it's still part of the Semitic group. For example, a town in uh, Yemen near Sinai is called Kokoban, that's a South Arabian name, just means the star of the planet, but here the definite article is Han, so that would make it totally separate from Arabic. Um, probably you know, those back to Sabine days. Uh, Northwestern Semitic languages have a definite article as a Ha, uh, for, for, for example, in Hebrew, for example, in Phoenician. Hakohen and Hebrew, the priest. So that's also a separate branch of Semitic languages. And the languages, uh, Ammonites and uh, Moabites and um, Edomite, are also Northwestern Semitic, appearing in the 8th and 9th century BC. And they would uh, be more related to obviously Phoenician, which is Hebrew, Aramaic, also Northwestern Semitic language. I'm trying to really summarize. Really complicated questions into our song. Yes, there's a famous acronym. Okay. So, no, no, but DDAM is also a very important site. Uh, and uh, I think the exhibition you're referring to is called Rose of Arabia. Uh, it was, I, I saw it in Paris. Uh, France has invested a lot of its uh, cultural uh, policy money uh, in archaeology into excavating Saudi Arabia. Uh, the excavation that joined the UN general. We essentially found Nabataean and Roman stuff. It's one of the furthest outposts of the Roman Empire, uh, but that was a French, a French um, project. There's a huge project. Saudi Arabia is the biggest open air museum for rock art. And uh, the area of southern Saudi Arabia, with a lot of South Arabian restrictions, is the area of the National Island, and that's the base area of the uh, uh, French in the last uh, 10 years. So, a lot of stuff has been done. And Saudi Arabia is a, a sort of new frontier for Iron Age, first of all, in the Sierra Club. Yes, okay, uh, much later on. Uh, for the Iron Age, of course, I mean, people in the Iron Age, if you're referring to sites like Loyola, or if you're referring to sites like uh, so Iron, Age, uh, Iron Age sites like uh, Circle of Hindu, etc., they're now using writing. Uh, the first script that appears here is a South Arabian script called Hassian, from the name Al Hassa, in the long oasis around the coast of Saudi Arabia. Uh, actually, they're probably this wrong one, too, because First inscriptions in Arabia are cuneiform in Bahrain. We find many Mesopotamian texts uh, from the early 2nd millennium BC, but in Acadia, in Kuwait, you have also texts. But Hassan is a language that is used as from the first century BC. It's a Semitic language, but before that, we have no idea whether the people on the East Coast of Arabia spoke Semitic languages. They adopted the script, they adopted a language which is, uh, has, appears, of course, the relationship maybe to Arabic, but there are very few seen inscriptions and they tend to be very short. There's one that was found actually on the mission. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Very much, very, very much. Um, I don't want to get into geopolitics. This is how it was explained by. The director uh, of uh, the Mashrak project, who was one of the biggest specialists, uh, South Arabian and early Arabian researchers, a French man at the French Academy and a French researcher called Sola. When I was in Saudi Arabia in 2012, uh, yeah, I said, How come Saudi Arabia has given us uh, accommodation, paid for our workers, paid for our food, uh, and invested so much into letting farms and stuff into the kingdom? Well, I think it's an element of soft power and cultural policy. It was a decision I think by the late King of Allah, who was 
actually real for the reformer. And uh, we decided in 2005 to welcome the first fire exhibition in the museum in Saudi Arabia, the German exhibition to sign on. That's how it's been escalated for more than 15 years. And we know a lot more about this organization and so that because it means to me that it was a recent project. And all other projects are called Suit. Uh, a lot of them concentrated in the jazz. We've got the poetry project on the Mexican side. Obviously, both of us have uh, San Marino as part of the Mexican Kingdom after Petra. And uh, one of the first exhibitions also in 2005 was the project, the Hegra project. You see the Mexican tombs in Hegra and Aula, sort of national reserve, very similar to those of Petra, maybe less elaborate, but less showing Hellenistic features. But and it's also the last house out of most of the world in the park. There's a lot of evidence for the world in the place of Sandy. It's actually Roman compost in Roman influence, so it's great for us out. The owners here are very keen to control the entrance to the Red Sea, so they probably made the camp in an island facing. Uh, Asir, the Southern Most Part of Saudi Arabia, were very far down, the Yanu and Shizan, the Yanu and the Surge that were down. I mean, the Romans are going to remain very well in uh, Tony Matthews' home, South of the Sea. Uh, they mounted an expedition to Yemen with Navitian guides. They besieged Marib. All this is mentioned in the altar of Augustus in Rome, and they could have conquered Saudi Arabia, but uh, part of their fleet coming out of the sea was destroyed by storm. They were misguided by Guides who were sent by a prime minister there called Shuai or Sihayas. All this is mentioned by the historian Strabo because the expedition was asked from Egypt by the Roman government of Egypt under Augustus, in his house with the Christian prime minister. So, but I'm talking about things that happened much later, 500 years, 30 years later, than what I wanted to describe in this time. <laughs> What I wanted to emphasize is conflict with the Arabs, a lot of savagery, a lot of battles, but at the same time, a form of co optation, integration, uh, as from the centuries. The Arabs are moving in your trade, your trade is in full swing in the days of the Assyrians to control the Levant coast, your trade goes in 60 days according to the lives from them all the way to Gaza. And of course, the main emphasis is that in sense that other goods as well. Probably other things coming from the field of water, purely the field, maybe from the subcontinent. If somebody could find a way to clone myself into three people, I could ask you a question. Okay, uh, yes, it's a small territory, but uh, one of the big sites from the uh, OMR, from the Northern and Iraq subculture is Shanal, which is on the outskirts of the city. Uh, you've got another site called Masafi, I think, which is on which was excavated by the French in the 1990s by a woman called Miss Lewong, who still excavates the United States in Ethiopia. Uh, those who excavated in Ethiopia well, were excavating in Ethiopia prior to current events, but those who were excavating in Yemen before, obviously since 2011, Yemen has been completely off, uh, off that path. Well, I can't hear much, but they've got some notes. Mm. Oh, quiet. I can't hear. It's too, um, there's too much echo. I really, I didn't know that. But he's like, yeah, one of the greatest scholars in the UK on pre-Islamic Arabs. His book is not actually, Redso is 
a brick of 600 pages. Uh, Tim McIntosh Smith, the part of uh, the Iron Age Arabs, say until the Nabataeans is about 150 pages of that book, which I have incidentally here. If you want to pass it around. Um, which is available here. So I mean, you can you can buy it here in the Emirates. And this one, Arabian the Arabs, is from 2001. It's quite old. Well, I mean, 22 years, but it's it's a very interesting introduction to Yemen and Saudi Arabia, uh, what is known then. So there's a big emphasis on the South Arabian kingdoms of Yemen, Fatima, Sabah, Kataban, uh, and Timna. Uh, Timna is actually very important because um, they, um, they are very much traders. They send caravans and they have a colony actually in Dina. We spoke about Dina. They are South Arabian descriptions of uh, people from Timna and people from another city called Barakish, which is also very very science, uh, all around uh, Arabia, especially Timna. And there are actually, there's a sarcophagus from someone from Timna in the town in Egypt. So they're very much in the of South Arabia, so not caravans. Unlike the Sabines, who let the caravans pass from Kadamah and the river east, that were essentially a sort of territorial agricultural community. Uh, so the Medeans, that's right, Timna is the capital of the Timna. Uh, the Medeans are the Medeans are people who are very much engaged, engaged in the trade, uh, in the Arabian trade. Of course, when you have to cross deserts, you have to take protection of the tribes in northwest Arabia, you cross the Nefu Desert, the Eastern Jazz. So the way the uh, Arabs would make profit would be through say passage buys and uh, probably feeding these caravans in the first place and protection them against safety. Uh, but the organizers of caravans going right up to Gaza were actually Medeans and Iranians. The king of Hyderabad actually goes right to Oman, to so far. So far as now, it's the land of frankincense. And there's actually a site which you can visit in the far later on from the Roman period to the well, classical period, which is the site of Koroi near Salama, which is actually a lot of times. He's not supporting a lot of them. Um, Sorry, this, this was just an overview. When it's called Well, I'd love to talk about that. I don't know, it's a lot of stuff. You found, they found an insertion in Taimon, the Germans, and that is. Taimon is in Western Saudi Arabia. It's an oasis which is, say, six, seven hundred kilometers north of the east of Jeddah. There was already an inscription that was done in the 20th century by Karwan Tru that mentions the inscriptions of Nabonidus from Babylon to BC, King of Babylon, and all the oases that are mentioned there in the Quran and Muhammad are already there. The Haibaru, the oasis of Haibar, which is in the south, is there. Uh, Ifedan is also mentioned. So these were important outposts already in the first millennium, the first millennium BC. Nabonidus is a fascinating person. People thought he was crazy. He's actually the Nebuchadnezzar uh, of the Book of Daniel. Nebuchadnezzar is not the only king who was chosen to build Jerusalem, but uh, it's actually a mistake. Uh, the Daniel was in May, probably in the third century, so it's uh, quite late, actually, you see. And actually, Nabonidus, the last king of Babylon, is the king who loses the kingdom. Who sees the writing on the wall and then he's actually building the wall, uh, and who actually loses his kingdom to the Persians, to King uh, uh, Cyrus, because he's basically pissed off the clergy of Babylon by venerating the God Sin, the moon god of Iran, and also the moon god of Arabia, and uh, actually going to transfer the capital to his in the basis of time. Sorry? 
Not tell me that. No, no, a system is taking the Bible where they actually associate one king against the other king. Now, Nebuchadnezzar obviously really exists. He's the creator of the new level of the empire. His father, Nabuchadnezzar, Nabuchadnezzar, he's a number. The real name of Nebuchadnezzar is Nebuchadnezzar, or in the Babylonian. I mean, Nabuchadnezzar, the writing for 10 minutes. He is the one who goes right uh, up to Anatolia, uh, to the borders of Egypt, and destroys Jerusalem. Uh, and uh, actually, he quotes many people from Judah, including uh, Prophet Jeremiah. Uh, there are mentions in Babylonia of villages and people who use the names or put to work, and they deport people in the same way as the Syrians do. The Syrians in the 8th uh, century, before hundreds of thousands of people, they brought the according to Sagar, more than 101,000 people to go from Judah after the siege of Lake Ish. And this is this is the disappearance, you know, when the northern king of Israel disappears, this is why the sort of 11 out of 12 tribes of Israel disappeared, just because they get deported across the Syrian Empire. They all lose their customs. I'm going to mention a site that was excavated by the government of Syria, that's actually a comment. Work in Limo, essentially, the largest Neo Syrian site in Syria. And they found early on in the late 80s tablets where you have names like Netanyahu, Sikiyahu, first generation. The tablets are dated from the conquest uh, from the Assyrian by the Palace of New Babylon, but the site is still there. It says so this is in the new center. And the second generation, they all have Babylonian names. So basically, or Mesopotamian names. So basically, these Judah Heights or Israelites are just taking up the customs of the country, speaking Aramaic or even Assyrian or Babylonian, and giving their children the same names. <coughs> what actually, even people mentioned in the book of Esther have the same name. You see, it's Hebrew. You know the name Mordecai in uh, Hebrew? It's actually Mordecai, the man of Martyr, Martyr the God of Babylon. So someone who we see as having a quintessential Hebrew name has got a pagan polytheistic name referring to the name of Babylon. Something completely anathema, probably to the one that of the <coughs> Esther. Esther is from the goddess Ishtar. What? <coughs> I don't know, but yeah, Esther is not, not the original. Uh, I don't think that's funny about the Bible. The Assyrian kings are mentioned in later sources by the Bible, the Book of Kings, and the Chronicles, and by Herodotus and Greek historians. And the um, Chronicles of the Book of Kings get more or less their, the events and the names of the Assyrian kings' wives, the uh, names of cities. And the Greeks do not. They mix up several things, and because, simply because Herodotus is writing in the first century BC. And the Book of the Kings and the uh, Chronicles are probably some of the earliest books in the Old Testament because they're based on Chronicles of the Kings of Judah. So they're looking at animals and chronicles that already exist and taking the information from there. For example, all the names of the kings of Syria are the Hebrew versions of names uh, of a certain name. Sennacherib, the one who built the people of is Sinaharibah, but um, we know these kings because, yeah, uh, we know these kings who the way to be They're certainly more accurate than what the Greeks of a lot of the was uh, starting in the starting city. But I'm, I'm going off on a tangent. In time, yes. Uh, yes, yes. Well, obviously, uh, Mosul is being kind of off limits. Sorry? Nineveh, I think you can go to Mosul now because uh, the Italians have come back to this way. Well, certainly in Iraqi Kurdistan, you have a whole network of canals over to Nineveh, which where you have Assyrian reliefs of the gods. Next to the hoop, you have a place called Al Mazma, over Al Mazma, with a procession of gods. Uh, and then Further down, there's an Italian expedition by uh, I don't know if it's, uh, the Iowa Greeks, the Neil Morandi, who on these canals came 
for critical uh, criticize or that's an enemy. Uh they um, found also like a uh a monumental relief uh of uh dating from the rain snacker uh with the Eastern gods. You have an aqueduct in a site culture along the line of Kurdistan, also for these waters brought from the Zagros Mountains to be a city of Nineveh, which was a architecture of 25,000 people in the late century, which is a stable. Babylon would be a big area. These are the largest cities of the ancient world before Romans uh, in Western ancient world. Thank you. Is there a, is there a specific way I should take it? Thank you. Um, just to say that um, to Zoom. I'll leave Zoom now. Right?